If you uh, would like to see the panelists at, as they speak, just click the button on your, on your top right of your screen uh, to have it sent to the speaker view uh, so that you can see our panelists as they speak. So hello everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Um, greetings from the CCD and some of our fabulous Wesleyan alumni. Um, very excited for this panel about careers in business across functional areas of business. And to kick it off, I'd like to have our panelists please share your name degrees you've earned both from Wesleyan and any other universities, and just give a 30-second summary of your career journey from graduation to now. So Jessica, could I have you kick us off? All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Thomas. I'm class of 08, and I graduated with a degree in English with a minor in communication. Um, afterwards was a pretty interesting journey. So I went from working retail to going to law school, to going to business school, to going to um, back to retail and then going into government contracting. So currently I work at uh, Booz Allen Hamilton as, a, um, as an HR transformation consultant. So I'm just pretty much a consultant on working with lately our project with the Department of the Navy, which is trying to innovate um, how sailors can get paid easily so yeah awesome thanks and Mitsu how about you hi uh, everybody nice to be here um I graduated from Wesleyan 94 95 I was kind of like a swing student so go PKs go golden hearts yay um let's see as soon as I graduated um I moved to Boston because I wanted to explore my passions around music and art I lived there for about two years before I decided to move back to Atlanta. Um, my dad unfortunately became ill with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, and I wanted to be kind of a, here for, for his care. Um, and at the same time, my student loans started to come due, so I needed to find a real job. And I decided uh, to look in the classifieds because that's what was happening, because I'm older. And um, I stumbled upon a job uh, that was looking for an architectural editor and I wasn't quite sure what that meant but being a theater major or history minor I was like let's give it a shot and so that started my career in architectural real estate owner representation and eventually now I am about eight years into being an interior general contractor so not what I expected to be doing but I have to say that I love being where I am. Awesome, thank you. Um, Danielle, how about you? I am a Wesleyan graduate from class of 2006. After undergrad, well, I interned in school while I was at Wesleyan with BB&T. And when I graduated from Wesleyan, I started, I took a teller supervisor position in Atlanta in Buckhead. Um, realized quickly that I don't want to be a banker <laughs> and I started studying for the CPA exam but with the CPA exam you have to work with a licensed CPA so I needed to get out of banking uh, I applied and utilized my network I got my first accounting job with CNN International in 2007 oh wow it seems like it was a lot longer than that but um, I have I think my career, I've operate, operated as a consultant since I go in, I fix really big issues, I clean it up, I make everybody happy, and then I get bored, so I tend to leave or look for my next challenge. Um, but now I am Director of Accounting at Clark Atlanta University. My last position was with the Georgia Lottery, so I've been around a lot. Um, what I've learned is that if you wanna stay in corporate, the biggest thing that I needed to do was learn systems, learn technology, become the forensic accountant that I knew nobody else was going to be, was, was going to have. Um, so the more systems you know, the more ERP systems you know, you know, that really has been the kicker for me. I've implemented, I've installed, I've upgraded, and now I am trying to make sure that Clark Atlanta stays open through this pandemic. <laughs> and we are the one school in the Atlanta University Center that has not laid off any employees. I have been able to salvage jobs through since quarantine began in Atlanta. Um, 
I can't complain. Like I said, this is my office until it gets cold. So I am kind of enjoying it right now. I, I'm really enjoying my career so far. So I am, uh, thank you so much for having me. Awesome, that's fantastic. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Amber, how about you? Hello, everybody. My name is Amber and I graduated from Wesleyan just like, I guess it was a year ago now, 2019. Uh, it feels like a lifetime ago at this point, but you know, we're all here now. So I majored in international business and marketing communication and Spanish. And I'm in my first job post-grad. So I started out at Andros ENT and Sleep Center. I work for an ear, nose, and throat doctor. She owns an ENT and audiology clinic and a med spa. So I do all of her marketing. And after about a year of working there, um, so just recently, we decided to open up a second clinic and expand our current one. So I got a promotion. I hired on a couple of um, marketing coordinators to try and make everything work. And we're in the process of doing all of that right now. So having a lot of fun. Awesome, thanks Amber. Um, and Madison, how about you? Hi everyone, it's been great hearing all these crazy career journeys. Um, so I graduated from Wesleyan in 2015 with a degree in neuroscience and um, had full intentions of going to get my PhD and uh, the universe decided that was in the cards for me. So I utilized my network and was able to make a left turn into industrial engineering at a small manufacturer and was there for a couple of years, um, specialized in uh, manufacturing systems analysis and uh, data management, that kind of stuff. And then I decided to get go to business school and I just started my current role as a senior business analyst at Nextera Energy, um, also Florida Power and Light uh, in June. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so now we have that overview. Um, let's move on to getting a more specific, getting more specific into the fields that you work in. So could you share a brief overview of the field that you work in currently and share one specific piece of advice you'd give to someone looking to enter that field? So what should someone um, considering that field, that industry, your specific role, what should they know about? Um, and Madison, how about you go ahead and kick us off there as well? Sure. Um, so I'm in, I am in the energy industry, but um, my role in analytics is really just applicable to any industry. Um, I'm responsible for understanding and analyzing large amounts of data um, and being able to boil those insights down into actionable recommendations for uh, leadership and other colleagues. Um, so my advice for getting into business analytics is you don't have to be a math whiz or a programmer to understand statistics and data. Um, it's more about understanding the data structure and as Danielle said earlier, the systems that the company uses um, and just general statistical concepts. Um, so my advice, take the opportunity to build your analytical skills in any role. Um, whether it's analyzing results from an experiment or finding a way to collect and use data for a, new, for a business problem that you find on an internship. So making sure you flex those analytics muscles. Thank you. Awesome, perfect, thanks. Um, and Mitsu, how about you? So I work for, um, work for Leafly Construction and as I mentioned, it's an interior construction firm. Um, it is a woman-owned business and I'm proud to be able to have been an alum of a women's college and now work for a women-owned construction company. Um, I basically serve as a project director of our executive oversight for all the higher ed projects that we that we have. And so I think that my one piece of advice is for anybody who's interested in construction, clearly, you know, whatever perceptions there are, I'm not your typical interior construction or general co contractor. I mean, that's what I am. Let's be real here. Um, is to keep asking questions and push past your comfort zone. Um, I've been in the construction industry now for 20 years. Um, I still ask a million questions every day. And I think that, um, you know, women offer a very interesting perspective specifically to construction. And uh, I think that 
you know, a key element in that is that I listen to our clients in a little bit of a different way. And I think that that makes a huge difference. So push past uh, your comfort zone. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Jessica, how about you? Um, so currently with my job, I work with uh, HR transformation. So one thing about uh, what I like about what I do with contracting is that it is like what uh, Daniel said, is that after you get done with one thing, it's on to the next. You're solving a next problem, which is what keeps me at the same company because otherwise I take the same approach where I'm like, okay, we've done this project, we've solved it, let's leave. So um, I like that aspect of just dropping in, solving an issue and leaving. But um, I think the biggest piece of advice I would say in addition to what Madison and Mitsu have said, which is continue to ask questions, always ask questions. And for us, with what I do is, which we work for the military, is try to put yourself in their shoes. So right now, one of the, the projects that we're working on is HR transformation, and they have to use 100 different systems just to get paid. And if you have to use 100 different systems just to get your paycheck, I wouldn't like that very much. So one of the things is being able to sit and identify and say, okay, if your loved one is on the other side of the world, what would you prefer to be able to access their money or your money, your paycheck for that for that end. So um, it's just trying, I like the fact of having the challenge to bring a 200 year old uh, institution into present day. So that was something I would definitely say, keep being curious, keep asking questions and definitely um, speak up when it comes to um, being questioned, so yeah. Awesome, good advice. How about uh, Danielle? Okay. Um, Amber, I heard you say your degree was international business and Spanish, same here until grad school. Um, I honestly, if you wanna be successful in accounting and actually move, because it's easy to get pigeonholed and stay in one position for a long time, you have got to be up on your systems I have been waiting for 16 years for Excel to no longer be the data analytics spreadsheet software, but it's not going anywhere. So become an, an Excel super user. I know Excel, I write BBA, you gotta get in there, learn it, show people that you can do it and the jobs kind of come to you at that point because those are skills that we don't really teach in college. Um, I think I took advanced Excel courses at Emory's Continuing Education Center after in like 2007 because I needed to sit for the CPA exam. Um, then systems. If you can get in, I have worked for, I don't know how many different companies, but I've worked with any, all of the large ERP systems, SAP, Oracle, Great Plains, PeopleSoft, the new ones, Acumatica, the one we use in higher education is Banner Financials, which is very specific to higher education. Um, I didn't know that before I switched to higher education last year and I'm having to learn it, but it's easy to learn because I have so much experience with other ERP software packages. Um, the best thing I can say for you as accountants, get your money at the door. I wish people would tell people that because it's accountants are very numerous. However, good accountants are very, very difficult to find. And because accounting and finance tends to be a cost center in companies, meaning we don't generate revenue for the bottom line, um, they want to keep expenses as low as possible. So what you've got to do is come in and offer something that no one else offers so that you can but justify asking for more than their base rate. Because I tend to not move unless it's a $10,000 increase. I'm not you know, unless I'm bored and I just need a new challenge. <laughs> but um, my mentors tell me like, you are, you move a lot. And I'm like, yeah. Um, I've worked with employees who've been in companies for 30 years and they can't tell me anything new about any new software, any new procedures, no process improvements, no new technology. And I don't, I'm terrified of becoming a technology relic because that's how I get pigeonholed and wind up sitting in the same position that I've been in for 10, 15 years. Um, but yeah, for me, systems, Excel, and 
your resume really, really, really matters. Um, I look at resumes all day. I'm hiring for an accounts payable manager now. And it's, there are a lot of tips and tricks, but your resume, honestly, the systems that you've learned. If out of Wesleyan, I think, what did I know? I knew a little bit of Excel. I interned, so I knew some of what BBNT used. Like, I don't care what it is that you've picked up. I don't care if you worked at Walmart and used Kronos for docking time. You put that on your resume. You look like you know all the systems and softwares and everything that you can so that then when you get in there, it's like, oh, this is not new to me. I've seen this before. I've got a little bit of the background structure of how this new software works, so I can learn to apply it to where I am. That's my two cents. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, very relevant. Um, and Amber, how about you? All right. So I work in marketing, which is kind of broad. When I explain it to people, I just kind of say like any internal and or external representation of the company kind of goes through me. So if it's like social media pages, press releases, um, if we end up being on the news, um, branding, all that kind of stuff. So my one specific piece of advice, it was kind of hard to come up with. I was trying to think of something really inspirational, but instead <laughs> I decided that if you want to go into marketing, you can really specialize in something, but you also kind of want to know a little bit about everything. So, you know, know how to make a flyer, know how to edit videos, um, know how, know all the social media platforms. Um, and especially unless you're working for an agency, but even if you do that, learn as much as you can about the business you're working in. I mean, I knew nothing about your nose and throat before starting. And now I feel like I know everything. If you, you know, have a sinus problem, we have a solution for you. Like, and learning how to communicate that to people. Um, and so just learn as much as you can about your industry, learn as much as you can about, um, just always know how to do something. You know, I never wanted the doctor I work for to be like, I need you to do this. And me go, oh, I don't know how you know, that's never an answer. Just like, I'll figure it out. All right. Like I'll get it to you tomorrow. So that's what I got. Awesome. Very relevant. Um, I think a theme we've heard from all the panelists has, have, has been to stay curious, to ask questions and to keep challenging yourself because there's more to learn after you graduate. So good themes there. Thank you. Um, okay. On to our next question. So I'm sure you remember trying to navigate that first career decision um, as you were in your senior year um, or after graduation. So could you share some specific resources and strategies that you used um, to really kind of navigate that decision and pursue your first step after graduating from Wesleyan? What really helped you out through that process? Um, and Amber, we'll go ahead and start with you. All right, so since I'm a recent graduate, I know there are a lot of resources that were just starting when I was finishing college. So I know that, you know, the Center for Career Development was super helpful with um, my resume and helping. I know I had to take a PDE class, which got like my LinkedIn page looking really nice um, and really figuring out like, how do I market myself and figure out what people are wanting from me um, in interviews. And also something that was really awesome was I moved to Minnesota, so that's where I am now. And I found out that there are actually a few uh, Wesleyan grads who are here as well. So I reached out to them and was just like, hey, let's go get coffee. Like we're in the same industry, it's like business, marketing, whatever. And we just got together and I always just asked their advice, picked their brain. Um, figured out how their job search went and that was really helpful and also made me feel really supported especially in a new place so like a whole new state across the country so that was fantastic and for actually finding a job um, my recommendation would be to apply for jobs on multiple platforms I don't think I really understood that when I was searching for jobs and now that I actually hire people, I know that it costs a lot of money to, you know, maybe have a posting on LinkedIn. So a lot of companies will only use Indeed or only use their company page or, you know, whatever. So I remember just being like, okay, on Monday, I'll apply for like four jobs on Indeed, Tuesday, four on LinkedIn, the next day, like four on Glassdoor and making sure I really hit all of them because it can get kind of confusing 
uh, with all these new technologies and how you can find a job. Awesome. Thanks, Amber. Um, meet Sue, how about you? Um, we'll see. Well, as I, as I guess I touched on earlier, when I graduated, um, I had a theater art history minor. And so I moved to, I moved to Boston because I wanted to kind of pursue an internship um, opportunities that I and network and connections I had made my junior year and they were great and I was having a great time. Um, but I was having a great time. I needed to kind of, you know, settle down and like really try to figure it out. And so my, my theater and my, my music and my art network was huge, but I needed to figure out how I was going to turn that into more of a living. And so uh, with moving back to Atlanta, getting back into a more familiar network um, and also being able to help, you know, my family, uh, I strategically was able to interview successfully at this architecture firm using some of the knowledge that I'd learned in art history at school. And I was also to, able to make an impression on them because of the level of detail that I was able to get to. So thanks, Dr. Bailey, for, you know, kind of teaching me all of that. Um, and then from there, it just kind of, you know, took on. And so I never, ever thought that my minor would be instrumental in my career. And here I am. Um, and so for, you know, the level of detail that I was able to to harness from my love of art transferred to that. And now I can basically, I'm a walking specification manufacturer library and it's great. So that's kind of, you know, my, my interesting segue from my liberal arts degree into the business world. Awesome, thank you. Shows the power of that education. <laughs> um, Jessica, how about you? Um, I would say initially coming out of undergrad, I did not know how to search for a job. Um, it was a little bit difficult. So entering search terms and doing that was very new. So um, it ended up being a little bit tough for me finding a job after undergrad. But I will caveat that with after graduate school, after getting my MBA, um, I moved to Maryland. And one resource that I used that was very unlikely, in addition to online search, I actually went to the Department of Labor, which was very, which people don't typically do. But I definitely, after doing that, I advocated, I advocate for it because I went there and the person at the Department of Labor was like, we're looking for people with college, uh, college degrees because the state of Maryland requires that you have to earmark certain interviews, which allow me to get at least to the interview phase because of state requirements to be able to at least get there. I may not have gotten the job, but I at least got to the interview phase and I got past the um, inevitable resume pile, which was good. So I, um, that was one strategy that I use and would still use. Um, and in addition to that, networking, of course. Um, uh, for me, with, with networking, I pulled from my graduate, but I also, with, when it came to undergrad, uh, using my English degree helped because I started out doing proposals. So a lot of proposal work to get contracts was a lot of, for me, specifically extemporaneous writing, which is English for something, three something. So basically uh, being able to not just write reports, but being able to write a proposal accurately and proposals are in pretty much a time crunch. That was my gateway into the business world as far as contracting. So uh, working with the labor department who helped me figure that out, so yeah. Awesome, great advice, thanks. Um, Danielle, how about you? Well, after I, I interned with bb and in while I was at Wesleyan and it opened some doors mostly because when I left Macon and came to Atlanta, I just applied for jobs and got it. It's not the position that I wanted out of college, but um, I believe LinkedIn was still really new when I graduated. So it was a good resource. It's way bigger, better, and absolutely re required now <laughs> um, if you want to find a job. But I, I think the biggest thing for me was just to leverage my network. I asked around. I applied to any and everything, whether I thought I was qualified or not. Um, 
I learned a little trick. I don't know if this is ethical. I hesitate to say it out loud, but I've seen where candidates, and because I know what I'm looking for, I look for it now. Candidates will put text. They will take the body of the um, job announcement, copy it and paste it in white text against a white background and submit that. And when our, you know, when the search systems look for those keywords in the job posting, it pulls those, it will pull your resume because it's searching for those keywords, like the hashtags essentially. Um, I don't know, like I said, I don't know if that's ethical. It can get you in the door if you're only going on electronic or automated search systems. Um, but if you know you're qualified and you really want to get in, I don't say that that's a bad thing as long as you know you are qualified for this position. Don't apply for jobs that you don't apply for a director or a CFO if you're coming out of college. One, they're not going to take you seriously. And two, they probably, if they do, they'll think you're crazy. Um, I did not know everything I thought I, that I needed to know when I graduated. So it was... I had to really identify what companies have a culture that I want to work for because you can't take every job. Every company doesn't, isn't a good fit for you. You can't take the first thing that accepts you just because you need a job. If you can hold off and really keep applying, you know, try to get your foot into, in the door where you want to be, I would say do that. Um, I am always going to say, you're on interviews you're interviewing the company as well so if you can get some kind of insight into what the rest of the employees look like do they look happy do they look miserable is it friday at 4 30 in your interview and people are already clearing out you know you got to really read the environment because you go into some place you don't know anyone um, a really good resource for that is glassdoor because i think it's glassdoor where they let employees former employees and current employees give their rate reviews on the employer, those are really accurate. Um, and the, the employers can't go in and change them. So I utilize that just to make sure, you know, hey, if I'm going to work in finance at this company, I don't want to see that five different finance managers left before me, because clearly that's a retention issue. Um, yeah, really think about what you want to do. If you, because like I said, if you take the first job that, that hires you, it's easy to get pigeonholed and to get stuck there. And you know, now you're in a career that you didn't even study in college and it has nothing to do with what you wanted to do. And now you're just paying bills. Uh, you have to be very intentional about the jobs that you take. Um, yeah, I'd say interview them as hard as they're interviewing you because you don't want to make a mistake on accepting them just because they accepted you. I saw a lot of heads nodding during everything that you were saying. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> awesome. Um, and Madison, how about you? So um, I'm actually going to take a different approach than Danielle. So when in my senior year, I was in the process of um, I put all of my eggs in one basket. I was going to go get my PhD and then I was going to stay in academia. And when that didn't work out, I was in the process of both trying to search for a job without having um, a business internship and also grieving not being able to accomplish that goal that I had set out for the entire four years of my college career. Um, and I was getting denied for secretary positions and because I was overqualified, but underqualified for everything else. Um, so, I really didn't have a choice but to take the first really good opportunity that was given to me. Um, otherwise, I would just be bartending for a year until the next cycle of grad school came around. So um, I just jumped into engineering and manufacturing headfirst. And that's where I picked up a lot of those business skills that I didn't think I would be able to learn that quickly. Um, so my advice is if you are stuck in a situation, take something and make the most of it. You don't have to stay there forever. Just get a little bit of experience and at least use it to gain a skill or two to put at the bottom of your resume to move on to the next thing. And you can also expand your network that way as well. Yeah, awesome, thanks. When I think 
the beauty of having multiple panelists with multiple journeys and experiences um, is cool to show the variety of tactics and strategies that you can use um, and show that there's not necessarily one path that fits everyone equally. So for the students on this webinar, um, it's really good to hear these different pieces of advice and weigh that against the other factors in your life right now too um, and see what the best strategy for you is gonna be. So um, love hearing the different perspectives and, and takes and advice here. Thanks y'all. Um, okay, so let's talk more about challenges and barriers. Um, so what was the most challenging situation that you faced in the transition from college to career? Um, and what advice would you give to someone navigating a similar challenge or barrier? We know that grads this year um, are preparing for potentially a challenging job search coming up potentially um, it's really encouraging to hear advice and strategies for navigating that so would love to hear what y'all um, how you have navigated that and Madison maybe we'll start with you again sure so um, again since I was a career switcher right out of college um, I dealt with a lot of imposter syndrome um, and I had a lot of issues with establishing credibility in an engineering role where I didn't have that specific skill set, especially in an, a rough and tumble male dominated environment in manufacturing. Um, so I threw myself into the job and my advice is to use your newness and um, to ask all the questions like some of the panelists said earlier. Um, and one of the most powerful questions that usually got me new projects and was able to get people to at least take me seriously was why is this done this way why do we do this this way that seems silly why does that take so long why do we do all these extra steps so then you'll be able to take on more of those improvement projects and actually add value to the company um, while learning along the way Awesome, thanks. Yeah, that imposter syndrome can be a big barrier. Yep. Um, Danielle, how about you? Yes, imposter syndrome is a real thing. I don't, I think I still suffer from it even 16 years into my career. Um, it's, yeah, well, one of the biggest barriers that, I, or challenges that I had was so the overarching category of accounting is finance, but what people don't realize is finance and accounting are very different worlds. Um, accounting pretty much, you're cleaning up stuff that's already happened. Finance, you're trending, you're forecasting, trying to figure out what's going to happen. And you two, the two brains are supposed to nicely mesh in the middle. Never happens that, never happens that way. Um, so for me, because finance does tend to be a very male dominated industry, um, at least the young guys, um, for me, it was hard to establish myself just to, I felt like I had to go in and prove myself. Like I'm going to go in, I'm this tenacious newbie. I don't know anything, but I'm gonna question all of your processes. <laughs> um, and while at times it's, a good thing to question like Madison was saying you need to figure out why is this done this way is there a more efficient way to do this is there something that can cost less employee input to do this in a more efficient way um, and a lot of people are like especially if they're lifetime lifers and have been in those roles for five to ten to fifteen to twenty years they're like huh I never even thought of it that way maybe there is a better way and that was kind of how I overcame those qualification ba barriers like you don't know anything you just got here but okay well let me figure out why you're doing something hard <laughs> and try to make it easier for you and now you thank me later on congratulations the tables have turned so it's just going in asking questions even if you don't know what you don't know because you won't on the day on the first day don't be if you're new you're supposed to ask stupid questions and there is a such thing as stupid question as a stupid question i don't care what anybody says but ask it what 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 are they going to say i'm not going to tell you <laughs> either you're going to answer my stupid question or you're not going to answer my stupid question and i'm going to screw something up later on so let's weigh how you want this to go <laughs> you know how, the, how you want this outcome to be um other than that 
just the, I hate to say the typical female stuff. Um, it is very difficult to get the respect that I know I deserve and demand in male dominated industries and banking in, I've worked in manufacturing, I've worked in IT sector, I've worked in government, I worked for the IRS for a few years. So it just depends on where you go. You kind of got to learn to read the room. Um, just, you know, knowing your audience, knowing your end users, knowing your internal and external customers and what they're going to need. Always, always, always be able to speak to what you produce. If you put something out, you better be ready to explain it and justify it and you know, because now that's your statement of record. And every, if it's wrong, they're looking at you like, who's this monkey? <laughs> who, who's, who let this moron put this, you know, final deliverable out? So it's very important to just know what you know, be confident in what you know. Even if you feel like you don't belong there now, you will. You'll Once you get in there and learn the ins and outs of the industry or of the organization um, and being in, exposed to different organizational types was very, has been very useful to me in my career because I can, you know, I always tell people accounting and finance, they're not hard. Accounting is very basic arithmetic. The application of it can get very, very convoluted. So as long as you have your discipline, you know, set, like you know your accounting stuff, uh, you should be good to go and take that and apply it wherever you can go. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Great advice. Um, Amber, how about you? All right. So I know that the people graduating soon are going to have a lot of struggles. I don't know who needs to hear this, but don't be ashamed to move back in with your parents or be in a living situation where you don't have to worry about yourself financially. Um, I personally didn't do that, but I was in a situation where I didn't have to, you know, take the first job that was offered to me. Um, but you know, the biggest struggle for me was just going to interviews and getting rejected or feeling like I wasn't good enough or being in the middle of an interview and just thinking this is not going well, this isn't it. And just wanting to walk out um, and knowing this is bad. And I used to think like, what's wrong with me? And there's nothing wrong with, you know, wanting to improve your interview skills or wanting to figure out, okay, are there any updates to my resume? But sometimes it's just that you're not what they're looking for. So to kind of piggyback off of like what Danielle was talking about earlier, that fit is everything. And sometimes for whatever reason, there's like one thing that throws you off. They're like, no, you're not really what we're looking for. And that might be a good thing. You might not have been happy there. Um, and now that I've been on the flip side of it, I know that I have met some really amazing people and they just weren't right for our job for whatever reason. Maybe we thought they wouldn't fit in with the company culture. Maybe you know, something that they said, we were like, oh, that's a little concerning. Um, but overall, they're fantastic. And I'm like, oh, I feel bad for like telling you that no, you didn't get the job. But, you know, that's kind of what I would say is just, you know, don't take it so personally all the time. And I know it's hard, especially when you just feel like you can't get a grip. So yeah, I mean, best of luck to you guys. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Jessica, how about you? Um, the biggest challenging thing I would say would be understanding mistakes. So one thing that happens in the working world is that there are mistakes that's going to inevitably happen. And I think the one thing that people transition from student to actual working person is that they think, okay, it's a, a sudden death. Either you do it great or you don't which is true in the working world. You do it great or you don't, but the concept is, is that rather than you make that mistake and you just completely, it cripples you to the point where you can't get past it to do better or understand that this is something that, hey, I'm not really great at, so let me figure out how to get better at it. Because a lot of times, if that was one challenge that I faced was understanding mistakes. So, um, critical thinking was something that I had, to, I have and had to really, really work at to be able to like say, okay, and this is kind of a, it's a practice thing to be able to go in rather than hear a client say, I need 10, you know, 10 X and be like, okay, 
versus now a client says, I need 10 of this. And it's like, but why? <laughs> or why do we need it now? It's October 1. Are we sure the budget can support that? <laughs> like asking those questions back as opposed to saying like, you know, sure, I want to do it right. I want to do it right. And another thing I would say is not getting in your own, so stuck in your own swim lane that you're not looking at what your colleagues are doing. So one of the things is that um, I'm sure you'll notice this once you get deeper into your career, you'll notice that some of your colleagues are moving a different path and it's okay to ask a question like, hey, so I noticed you got promoted to X, Y um, in X amount. What, what was different or what did you do or what, it, what are your... Um, what were your goals? So I think also learning to be, learning to get past your mistakes, learning to be specific in your goals, because now when you get on a job, your evaluation is based on goals you set. So whenever you set those goals, be specific because your pay is tied to that. And they'll say, oh, you were just vague. So that's why we gave you what we thought based on what we saw. So I think that's the big thing, getting past mistakes, learning to advocate for myself to show our work because it's kind of hard to talk about the great things you do. It's really hard to hype yourself up. So because it's like, I, I just go to work, whatever, as opposed to saying, no, I streamlined this to make sure that we are running this schedule on time to make sure that we are compliant with defense um, defense measures that require us to be compliant kind of thing. So I would that would be my biggest thing that I would say. Yes, 100%. We got a amen from Danielle too. Awesome. And Mitsu, how about you? Yeah, I think um, everybody, all the panelists really kind of hit the nail on the head with a lot of things. I'd also like to kind of go back and just, you know, I know I made a comment that I'm old, but you know, the internet wasn't really around when I graduated. Um, you know, networks, newspapers, that was kind of there. I mean, I wasn't you know, born in the 1900s, but you know, this is like 95. So you can tell that there's, you know, generationally a huge difference now between when I was out of school. And I would think, you know, one of my biggest takeaways is when you get out of school and you're looking for a job and you're eager to start your career, go ahead and learn how to set expectations. And I think that's really important because if you don't set an expectation and you're eager to please and you want to get the job done right as jessica said and you know over promise you're gonna get into a really awkward situation it does take practice it is not something that is intuitive to a lot of people but it's also how you can build trust with your business partners with your clients with your colleagues um, i have a lot of times where people are like hey i need a budget i need it now can you get it to me in an hour? I mean, I guess I might be able to, but do you want something rushed or do you want something that is really going to be able to tell the story that you need it to? It's okay to say your truth in those situations and your customers, your, your clients, your colleagues will start to learn that what you say, you know, you mean what you say, you say what you mean. And so that does take, some time to learn it. Uh, I still work through that myself. And I wish um, somebody had kind of said that to me as I was trying to navigate through stuff, because you always want to, you know, do your best job and you want to do it right and you want to do it efficiently and quickly and so forth. But go ahead and, and learn to kind of set the expectation. Um, be forgiving of yourself if you make mistakes and learn from the mistakes that you make. Um, I still make mistakes all the time, but I own it and I know it. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human beings and it's going to happen. And um, I think it's just, it's wise practice to, to give yourself some grace um, and, and work through it and, you know, never be afraid to take a step back to really discover your own big picture. Um, I think that's really important because sometimes you can get caught up in the things that you have to do to maintain, to get through to the next day. But, you know, I'm now 30 years out of school. Um, I have learned how to balance my passions with my career and, you know, blend them um, 
in a very unique way that makes you know me happy. And so I enjoy what I do and I can only bring my truth to and my spin to what I do. And you know, I think it's I think it's important to be able to get there, you know, and it doesn't matter how long it takes. Just, you know, try to try to give yourself some grace and understanding and others will follow suit. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I have some affirming comments to everything that you said there from the other panelists. Awesome. Um, okay, so we've covered a lot of content and, and some great insights there. And I want to make sure we have some time for student questions, if there are any. Um, so, EE, -E, I know you had a question you wanted to toss out. Feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and do that. Um, and if any other students on this webinar have any questions, please feel free to ask away. Uh, but EE, -E, do you want to kick us off with that? I think so. Um, I just want to ask Madison, like, if she can share specific analyzing programs that we can learn to be more employable when, um, as a business analyst. Um, thank you very much. Sure. So it really depends on um, it really depends on the company, what software they use. So marketing folks use a lot of SPSS and SAS um, for big data analytics, um, engineering and manufacturing process improvement. They use Minitab. Um, so if you do any like Lean Six Sigma work and process improvement, Minitab is going to be your, your best bet. Um, in my role, I use a lot of SQL and Power BI. Um, I don't necessarily use a ton of statistical software right now, um, but I have learned SQL and DAX and how to write Power BI, powerful, powerful Power BI <laughs> visualizations and code to be able to take those giant data sources and condense them down into just one chart that someone can make a decision off of. Um, and then for statistics, I think R is actually probably going to be the most applicable across wide industries because it's free, open source, um, and it's really flexible. I hope that answered your question. I know I just said all the softwares, but <laughs> um, R and uh, Power BI or Tableau. So pick a statistical software and pick a visualization software. Thank you, Madison. No problem, thank you. Awesome, thanks. Any other students have questions you wanna to toss out? I'll give a minute for anyone to come through. I see Shayla has her hand oh, raised. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, Shayla, go ahead and unmute yourself. What's up? Yes, um, this is a question that I would like to ask Amber. So I'm in the field of how do I put this? I'm, or, Amber, do you have any tips for, I have to pursue, all right, so I'm trying to figure out how to ask this. So right now I'm a pol history, politics, and global affairs major, and I'm interested in I'm interested in pursuing a career that, that's, all right. I'm interested in, I'm trying to figure out how to put the word. I'm interested in pursuing a career that's concerning international matters. That's, yeah. So do you have any tips for me? Hmm. Let me think. I would say if you can find an internship while you're in college, that would probably be the best thing. I mean, I remember that's what I did. You know, I got an internship in college and that was super helpful. I did it for a semester and you could do that too. I know the CCD has great options for figuring out different internships in the area. And I'm sure now there's a lot of remote ones too, which would probably be really good for international. Uh, so I would say to look into that. 
Um, thank you. I already have an internship right now. Okay, that's good. I, I would just really capitalize on that and add it to your resume and make it seem like you did a lot. <laughs> Sorry for pausing a lot. It's just that I couldn't find the right way to ask it or the right word. Or the right phrase. No, you're fine. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other folks have any questions? Want to make sure I leave room for student questions here. Uh, can I ask one for Amber? Yeah. Hey, Ashley, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Amber, I know you mentioned that this is your first job out of college. Do you have like any ideas of how long you would stay at like your first job? Would it be like a couple of years or? Hmm. Okay. My, actually my dad told me that I should probably stay at my first job for like at least a few years. Um, I guess it's a little bit tricky to be like, okay, you don't want to stay so short that it looks like you're job hopping and that can be concerning to employers. Um, but you also don't want to stay so long that you do sort of, then you're not as appealing to other employers. Like, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but just like a little bit of time as much as you can. I mean, if you absolutely hate your job, I would say that you should leave uh, and look for another one. It is easier to find a job when you already have a job. So if you have a job and you really don't like it, I would say, I don't know, maybe try to stick it out for a year. But if you really hate it, start looking for other ones and you can just say that you feel like you've outgrown the position or lots of things like that. Thank you. Next, I'd like to just add to that. I think I stayed at my very first job for about three years. It may have been too long, but I did learn how to be absolutely efficient with business systems. And so if it's a situation that you might be a little bit stuck in, uh, you know, definitely try to make the most of it and learn, be a sponge, take it all in. Yeah, thanks. And other panelists, please feel free to jump in on these questions too, if you have some more thoughts. Um, I think it, for that question specifically, it also depends on the industry. Um, so some industries are more open to, and it's more expected to move more frequently. Um, it also depends on personal factors and growth potential and company culture and things like that. So that can sometimes be a personal and sometimes an industry decision. Yeah, so one red flag for us when we were interviewing for engineers or um, someone in manufacturing um, was if someone stayed at a position for 10 years and there's no career mobility within that 10 years, it's a red flag that they're going to come in with some bad habits um, that they weren't able to move up in their company and they're just looking for a way out. So it is a delicate balance, that tenure question. I also agree. Um, one of the things that happens with contracting is contracting is dependent upon your period of performance, which may be from now until 2022, now until 2024. Um, so sometimes we do trade partners. So for instance, Booz, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, and um, KPMG and PwC, or now Guidehouse, play this nice little partner switch game. Um, so, but the only thing I would say, caution when it comes to switching is that everybody knows everybody, especially in the particular industry that you're in. So if you get a reputation for hopping, be it, make it a good one. So for instance, if you're saying I ended this, cause this happens, some people will be like, I ended this contract and I was looking for a, to stay specifically with United States Navy. My company decided to switch to army. So I'm going to somewhere where I can stay within that that's perfectly acceptable. Even if you said, okay, hey, I found I had this new skill that I didn't know I wanted to do. I switched from audit to HR transformation. Also perfectly acceptable. But like, understand that job hopping doesn't have as much of a stigma. It just depends on where you are. I just caution that know that everybody knows everybody. And most likely the person who you interviewed is likely friends with the person who was maybe your manager or your manager's manager. So leave right. <laughs> Absolutely. I, if, if I can piggyback off of that one, it really, um, I think the days of people staying in jobs for 30 years till retire, those are gone. Um, and you really become a more well-rounded well professional 
by being exposed to different companies, different organizational structures, different industries, you know, so get all of the experience, you know, get out there and expose yourself where you think you might want to be in one field, you'll be surprised what you can learn in another industry. Um, so I would say if you're going to take a first job, if you like it, I would say stay two to five years, but at the same time, always be improving yourself, always be making your resume more marketable, make yourself more marketable, you know, go and take some classes. I know I have to take CPE credits in order to maintain my, my license. So that's just a career requirement. If I don't, I'm no longer a licensed CPA and I'm not going to get hired anywhere else. So just make sure you don't let yourself get stagnant. Keep learning new systems, new software, new skills, you know, just do your, you know, you're, you're a company, you're, your person, that's your brand. So you've got to make sure that that brand stays as marketable and as sellable as possible. And on a money tip with marketable, if this goes with a glass door, if you notice that your particular job is not giving you market value and you notice that somewhere else is giving you that market value, do not be afraid to take that leap. Also, do not be afraid to ask because I found out that you can actually ask your job, hey, can you evaluate me according to my market value? And you can ask to be evaluated according to your peers and HR may come back and say, yes, no, maybe so. And if you find out, no, I have found and known people who have said, they said no, and their managers have come back and given them that raise to market value based on their work. And then some managers have just been like, okay, well, bye. <laughs> and they've left and there's there's no love lost but definitely understand that always think, ask for more money because it's expensive to hire employees it's expensive and it's a long process so if a lot of times if your employer can just give you five or ten more you know however much more money you're asking if they can if they have the budget for it they will gladly do that rather than letting good talent keyword good if you're good <laughs> if you're mediocre they will you know, all right, don't work out your two weeks, just finish out the day and we'll see you later, wait for your check. But it's, companies pay for good talent. So before you dip out, ask, hey, I got another offer from a company. If you guys can meet this, because they're, going, they're doing the same thing to you. As much as you're, you know, out there shopping and looking around, they're doing the same thing. So it's about making it a good fit for both of you guys. Don't ever sign an offer letter that you don't feel 100% confident because if you don't get that money at the door and you say, oh, they're gonna make it contingent upon bonuses and merit increases, do not do that. Those days are over. <laughs> you, merit increases are cost of living adjustments in 2020. That's a one to 3% increase year over year and that's if you meet performance requirements. No, get your money at the door. Ask for, look at salaries.com. Those things are updated quarterly. Find out what your industry average is if any, when you're asking for a salary range, tell them your top, not 55 to 85. No, you want 85, you go, you go ask for 85 because somebody's going to pay you $85 to do what they don't want to do. So never accept the first offer. That's I'm like, I'm going to bargain with you. I know you guys have the money to pay me what I'm worth. Yeah. Another thing on that, um, especially in your first role or two, um, don't be afraid to ask for relocation. That is an easy thing for companies to pay for. And moving is expensive. Y'all can see I'm still in boxes. <laughs> um, and it costs ten to $15,000 to move. Um, so even if that's an easy negotiating tool. And to tack on to that, understand the cost of living where you're going to. Absolutely. DC is more expensive than Georgia. So if your first job is telling you straight out, we're going to offer you a wonderful salary of 40000 a year. In Georgia, you're like, you're going to be okay. poor. <laughs> in D.C., you're going to struggle really, 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 really. You might as well get five roommates. Just get five roommates and live in a studio and figure it out. But like, understand your cost of living and go with that. So, yeah. Yeah, and don't be afraid to ask for, for that raise. Um, 
I mentor a lot of a lot of young women and some young men as well. And number one concern whenever they go in for a review of the being nervous is to kind of shy away from it. Don't be shy. My company knows I'm going to ask. Um, and if, you know, anybody, I was in a position once where they were like, well, why do you think you, you deserve a raise? I'm like, mm. I was like, because I'm the best at what I do. And I know it. And I can find it. So definitely ask. I agree with, with everybody. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love this. Awesome tips and advice. And it's so valuable to hear it from people who have been there and you know this is good stuff. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're at our time officially for the webinar. So uh, thank you so much. We'll close out for the students now. Um, we'll I'll be on here for a few more minutes and I think a few panelists will as well if students have questions offline. Uh, but just to formally end, we'll thank you all so much. Um, I tell students all the time about the power of the Wesleyan Alumni Network and this is just proof that um, the alums are invested and so caring and generous with time and insight. So we really appreciate, appreciate y'all. So thank you so much.